Good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, this is our the first candidates forum on climate and energy. We are uh, we're joined by the first Hampton District of State House of Representative candidates, um, Diana Zainal and Lindsay Sabadosa. And we have several panelists joining us. Before I get into that, I would like to, um, to mention that this is sponsored by Climate Action Now and the League of Women Voters of the Northampton area. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages the informed and active citizens in government. This means the League supports issues, but not candidates. So um, we're happy to have Northampton Cable Access TV here who is reporting this event live. They will also have it available for streaming on their website and on cable TV channel 15 if you want to view it again later. So um, the focus of this forum is to learn about each candidate's perspectives and priorities about a core issue of our time, which is climate change. As a moderator for this forum, my job is to help us move crisply through a range of questions aimed at exploring this area. So um, we're pleased to have both candidates with us. And I'd also like to introduce our panelists. We have, um, we have Adele Franks, who's a retired public health physician and steering committee member from Climate Action Now. Next to her, uh, we have our, our token male. That's <laughs> <laughs> Stanley Moulton, um, political, he's the opinion and political editor for the Daily Hampshire Gazette. Next to him, we have Nancy Poland, who is the Environmental Committee Chair for the League of Women Voters for the Northampton area. And then Jean Churdak, who's a board member of the League of Women Voters for the Northampton area. And she will be asking questions um, on, the, on behalf of the audience this evening. So, um, so please join me on welcoming our candidates, our panelists, and all the volunteers who helped to make this come together tonight. So let me tell you a little bit about how our evening is organized. Um, in the beginning, each candidate will have the opportunity to introduce herself in a three-minute opening statement. Uh, then we will take turns with our different panelists asking questions. And again, each candidate will have a chance to answer each question. And then we will conclude the forum um, with a two-minute closing statement from each candidate. So some instructions for our audience here tonight. Um, we're hoping that you will ask questions and have those um, asked on your behalf to the candidates. It's important, so we have, uh, I believe when you came in, you received some note cards. So you can write your question on those note cards. If you didn't get one and would like one, please raise your hand. We have volunteers who will distribute them to you. If you ask a question, it's very important that it be written so that both candidates can answer that question. So it can't be directed specifically at any one candidate. So please write it accordingly. And once you've written a question, um, you can just hold it up. Again, we'll have volunteers going up and down the aisle. So if you hold it up briefly, they will see and come and collect it from you. Those volunteers will then go through the questions. We, they might combine some of the questions if they're very similar. Um, and. Uh, and they will be selecting questions so that they touch on the greatest number of topics. So we may or may not have time to get to all the audience questions, but we will do our best. So um, please do turn off cell phones, other noisemakers. Um, please don't clap after individual questions. We'll thank everyone with a hearty thanks at the end. So um, instructions for the candidates. As we discussed, you'll have 90 seconds to answer each question. And we have some, some volunteer timekeepers um, who will be holding up um, signs to help you keep on track with that. If you do get to the stop sign, I ask that you complete your sentence, but briefly. Um, we'll be taking turns. Um, if, if, uh, if, a can if one candidate mentions the other by name, and then there will be an opportunity to, to rebut, um, and res which is responding to the other candidate. So if you wish to do that, you can ask, ask me as the moderator for that time, and we'll give you 30 seconds to respond. Um, only one rebuttal time is allowed. Um, so with that said, we're going to begin with opening statements. 
Um, the candidates drew straws <coughs> in advance to determine the order of the statements. Um, and the first speaker is going to be Diana. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, for the last 16 years, it's been my distinct honor and privilege to work for State Representative Peter Cocott. Peter was an incredible man who put forth a progressive agenda, and I was really proud to support his mission. Uh, through this work, I came to know local officials and local activists, as well as key players in state agencies. These important relationships are critical in many ways, but are especially beneficial as I look to become an agent of progress and change with regard to protecting our Earth. I worked with Peter on issues like fighting large-scale biomass plants and fighting pipelines that would have cut through valuable and protected lands. <clears throat> with Peter, both with Peter and as a Hatfield Selectman, I worked on matters of forest protection and land preservation. I'm currently working with one of the district towns on securing funding for an infrastructure project that will allow uh, the expansion of a business that manufactures a highly energy efficient product. This is real and tangible work that will have a lasting and positive impact on our local environment. Things I've done in the past are important. Things I'm doing now are important, sorry. But most critical is what I envision for the future. We know that as Massachusetts leads, others follow. We must put the Commonwealth at the helm of forward thinking and aggressive policies that will stop what we know is an inevitable environmental disaster. We need to work now to lay the groundwork for a cleaner and healthier future. We need to address the roadblocks to renewable energy put into our paths by public utilities. We need to address our over-reliance on fossil fuels and accelerate our renewable portfolio standards. We need to lift the net metering cap on solar, and we need to fully develop offshore wind farms. We can accomplish these things while managing my intersecting priorities of creating jobs and holding firm on policies of environmental and economic justice. These goals will only be realized if we set a big table. We must work together across the aisle with recognized professionals, committed activists, and stakeholders like energy providers. This is where my experience with collaboration and familiarity with state procedures and practices will be invaluable. In addition to this big table, let's have a big view. We have the opportunity to take our commitment to a clean environment to the global stage. We must continue to invest in UMass as a leading research institution in developing clean energy. We must harness the extensive academic resources we have here to put Massachusetts on the forefront of technology development that can be spread throughout our nation and the world. This will lead to a healthier planet, a strong and vibrant economy, and a strong and vibrant economy. I have the experience, dedication, and relationships to deliver on this big view. I thank the League of Women Voters and Climate Action Now for tonight's opportunity to discuss these matters further. Good evening. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and Climate Action Now for hosting, as well as everyone in attendance. Showing up and civic engagement matter, so thank you. I've spent a lot of time lately fact-checking issues like net metering caps, solar battery storage, and green banks. And I'm sure we're going to discuss all that and more during the question and answer phase. So I'm going to go in a different direction with my introductory remarks. While it may seem unrelated, I want to note that this past weekend was the 50th anniversary of Robert Kennedy's assassination, which led me to spend a lot of time thinking about how important the year 1968 was and how I believe that 2018 will be no less important. In 1968, the United States was at a crossroads, and RFK offered a message of hope and change. He offered a type of governing that was bottom up, not top down, and he brought new voices to the table by building bridges between different groups while never forgetting that he was there for the people. Again, our country is at a critical moment. The federal government is trying to move us backwards on almost every issue. Climate change is real, and Massachusetts has the opportunity to act, but only if we can claim a bold new vision. 
I am running for state representative to do just that. I am ready to step up to talk about climate change, not as, a climate, as an expert in climate science, although you can bet I will always be well informed, but as a bridge builder between those most directly impacted, the activist community and our legislators, many of whom are already on the right side of the issue, and I know more will be when they understand that this is not just an environmental issue, but an economic and healthcare issue. The Pioneer Valley is home to some of the best minds in the state, and I would argue in the country. Our area has the potential to lead in real research and development into clean technology. The problem is not a lack of ideas, but a lack of funding, attention, and investment. I want to close by sharing a story. As was noted in the Gazette today, Springfield has some of the highest asthma rates in the state, a fact that should alone push people to the streets to demand environmental justice. However, I was especially dismayed to learn that students at the Herena School have some of the highest rates in the state, which shouldn't be surprising since I-91 runs over their school. The story of climate change is not just the story of fossil fuel emissions. It is a public health crisis, an economic crisis, an education crisis, and a transportation crisis. We need to elect a public servant who understands this, and I'm that person. Thank you. Thank you to both of you for your opening statements. <laughs> okay, so our <coughs> panelists have prepared questions. Um, I'm, I'm just now realizing that they're not sitting in the same order in which we had planned the questions, so just be prepared. <laughs> Don't look at the next person sitting next to them. We'll be jumping around a little bit. Um, but the first question will be, uh, will be asked by Nancy, and Lindsay, you will be the first to answer. Okay. The Senate Ways and Means Committee is currently reviewing an omnibus clean energy bill that presents a rapid fire comprehensive approach to addressing climate change. The House traditionally favors a slower, incremental bill by bill approach. Would you try to persuade your colleagues in the House to move faster and adopt the Senate Omnibus Clean Energy Bill. Whatever approach the legislation takes, please identify what parts of the plan you think are the most critical and should be implemented immediately. So I, do, I appreciate the omnibus bill that the Senate is working on. The one weakness I see in it is that it doesn't might quite move as fast as we need to. We need to move to 80 percent renewables by 2030 and 100 percent by 2050, and the bill doesn't actually require that. So while I would like to say I'd encourage my colleagues to pass the omnibus bill, I think that we might need to piecemeal this one so that we can improve it rather than anything. Um, and I'm sorry, you asked about the most important pieces of it. Yes. Um, I think the um, renewable portfolio standards increase to 3% is essential. Offshore wind is absolutely something that we need to move towards. And I'm, there's so many important things, but I'm going to say the, the no new pipelines. Uh, I would also be in favor of breaking this down um, uh, a little bit. Um, I do like that in this bill, you know, they, they are aggressive um, about expediting our pathway to 100% renewable. Um, and I like that it also has components that protect our citizens, our ratepayers, um, from bearing the costs of repairing gas leaks. Um, and, and I like also that it requires state agencies to take the lead. Um, on renewable, um, switching over to things like electric vehicles and everything. But I think what I like the most about this bill is the um, creation of the Clean Energy Workforce Development Fund, um, which will, in addition to having clean energy um, initiatives, creates jobs. And so that's the part of it that I'm most in favor of. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will be coming from Adele. Yes, thank and you. Diana, it will be directed at you Sure. First. Sorry. <laughs> One vital part of the Senate's omnibus energy bill, is, is there an echo? A little louder. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Okay. <clears throat> is the creation of a strategic plan uh, to help us reach our Global Warming Solutions Act goals, 
uh, with the targeted emissions reductions by 2050. The omnibus bill actually includes a roadmap that has strong interim requirements for emissions reductions by 2030 and, and, at, and at 2040. We know now that we're unlikely to reach our emissions reductions goal by 2020. So we believe we need a strong plan that will allow us to continually monitor and adjust our progress so we don't fall short of our 2050 goals. Would you support such a roadmap as a priority? And please tell us why or why not. I, I would support, I mean, anything we can do to accelerate this process is, is a great thing. Um, and I, I would support a plan um, that accelerates it. Um, I think that our, you know, the, um, the, the, the bill filed, there's a bill filed by Sen Senator Brownsberger um, to adopt greenhouse gas emission limits by 2030 that was co-sponsored by, by Peter. And um, I would certainly be um, in favor of that, as well as other legislation authoring, authorizing the DEP to meet or exceed the international guidelines set forth in the Paris Accord. Um, I mean, of course, I would support any roadmap that moves us forward. It's really, it's not a question of, um, of support or not. It's a question of rapidity. It's a question of urgency. We can't, um, we can't, this is not something that we can put off over time. So anything that we can do, obviously, I'm going to be in favor of. Okay, uh, adopting some form of carbon pricing system is key in reaching Massachusetts carbon emissions targets. Car California currently has a successful model that shows economic growth is possible while regulating climate change. What form of carbon pricing do you think is the best model for Massachusetts? How would you convince the various stakeholders that it is needed and will produce the economic and environmental benefits that are desired? Well, I'm in favor. I'm in favor of a carbon pricing model that is actually going to wean us off of fossil fuel. So, while we do, I believe that we're going to move towards a green economy and we're going to create jobs through through solar, through research and development. And I believe this area can lead in that. But I think that we really need to be far more aggressive in that carbon pricing model so that it's actually reflecting the real cost of fossil fuel. One of the things that I don't think our, the model fully takes into consideration are the healthcare repercussions of fossil fuels. We're seeing, like I'd mentioned in my opening remarks, we're seeing increased asthma rates. There are just so many things that the model needs to encompass and we need to be more aggressive in that. So I do support carbon pricing as well. Um, it's the probably the single most effective way to reduce emissions. Um, I would favor a cap and trade um, initiative because that is most likely to cause reductions if it's done as a tax. There could be entities that just can afford to pay the tax. So there's, there's not as much incentive to actually uh, reduce their emissions. So I would definitely favor a cap and trade. Thank you. Our next question, um, Jean will read and it comes from the audience and Diana, you'll be answering it first. H3281 would divest the Mass Pension Fund from coal. Do you think Mass should stop investing in coal and other fossil fuels? If so, what would you do to support divestment? I do support di divestment of that. It should have happened a long time ago. Um, and, and I think we recoup that by investing in clean energy in initiatives. Um, that's, <laughs> that's about it. It's that simple. I'm absolutely in favor of divestment, and and I, I agree, so it's kind of hard to, re to respond. Um, we should be investing in clean energy initiatives. I know that many local colleges have started this process, and everybody should be doing this, even as individuals. We should be making sure that we are personally not making investments in companies that are harming our environment, our health, and our future. Thank you. Next question will come from Nancy. And Lindsay, you'll be answering it first. This one is about transportation. Transportation in Massachusetts 
is the major source of carbon emissions. Many solutions for improving transportation are very expensive and will be fought by the fossil fuel industries. What changes in transportation do you favor and how do you suggest we pay for them? Well, there are a few changes that I would like to see. Um, and I realize these are expensive initiatives, but we are making investments in our future. And you know, if we don't make these investments, then we actually don't really have a future because we are, we are hitting a tipping point. So the argument of expensive is very relative. Um, one of the key things that I want to see is actual rail developed in Massachusetts. We need the east-west rail, we need the north-south rail, but we need to be investing in public transportation in general. We need to, we're talking about cutting the PVTA. We don't need to cut, we need to expand, we need better routes. We need to actually make it a feasible alternative for people so that they can travel around this region and across the state. Um, there are, there, Senator Lesser has been talking about a possible regionalization um, so that we could fund it locally. I'm interested in that. I'm not sure that it's necessarily the best approach because I'm afraid that we will then get less funding from the state if we move in that direction. But I think that there are possibilities that we're gonna need to study. I would agree that we need to, we do need to develop our rail systems better. Um, but I think that we can also, I, I'd like to see us move towards electric vehicle technology where those will be appropriate. So in city bus routes, things like that. Obviously we have a lot of rural areas where, where those kind of vehicles wouldn't be able to serve, but where they can serve, I think we should be focusing on that. And I also think that our, our, our own fleet, our state fleet, we should be converting um, to electric vehicles. There was part of the VW um, settlement was supposed to be intended to um, increase the amount of electric vehicles in the state fleet. I, I happen to be married to a mechanic for a mass DOT. We talk about this stuff a lot. There's, there are heavy equipment, pieces of heavy equipment and things like that that could be converted to electric um, and they're costly, but if that settlement could use, be used to offset at least some of the initial purchases, I think that would be great. So converting to electric so that there's cost savings for those in-city routes and the, um, the shorter vehicle routes that are possible, then help offset the costs of where they're not possible. Thank you. My next question is coming from Adele, and Diana, you'll be answering it first. I'd like to bring up the topic of solar energy. Massachusetts has been moving forward with solar um, pretty rapidly until last year when we actually lost 3,000 jobs in the solar industry, which was the first time in many years we had been on the opposite trajectory of increasing jobs until then. And some of us believe that's directly tied to the state's uh, dismal um, action on uh, policy. In the last legislative session, the solar policy essentially went into limbo. Uh, the, the solar net metering caps have been reached everywhere. And um, uh, with the switch over to the new incentive program being so greatly delayed, there's been a lot of uh, problem. So the question for you is, what kinds of changes do you think we need to make to get our solar industry back on track and increase the amount of solar energy that we're generating, would you support eliminating the solar net metering cap and how would you work to get that through the House of Representatives which has been very resistant to, to that idea? And then lastly, are you committed to regulating the utilities to ha ask them to, in to mandate them to modernize the grid fast enough so that it can handle increasing amounts of distributed renewable energy. <laughs> In 90 seconds. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, <laughs> last week the House advanced uh, a bill increasing the current net metering cap by 2%, but it's just not enough. I would certainly work with colleagues to um, increase that or remove the cap if possible. That would be terrific because the, the problem isn't a willingness to invest. There's $78 million in solar projects on the waiting list. People are ready to, to make this investment, um, large scale and small scale. Um, so we should be, we, you know, we shouldn't be part of the speed bump in making that happen, quite the opposite. 
So I would certainly work with colleagues um, to, to lift those caps as, as best we could. The rest of the questions was... Um, regulating the utilities. Yeah, I mean, we should be regulating the utilities. Um, I, I, they should be switching over to renewables too, and I think part of that could be deregulating and making mi microgrids and that sort of thing would be, um, I think, a big part of allowing renewables to more, more easily source, you know, use those sources. So, yes. Um, I'm absolutely in favor of removing the net metering cap, and I'm absolutely in favor of regulating the utilities, but I think part of the question you asked is, how do we get these things through? How do we convince colleagues that that needs to be done? And we, we see that this happens time and time again, particularly in the House, where legislation just doesn't seem to move out of committee. I do a lot of advocacy work. I work to pass legislation with many groups across this state, and we are continuously frustrated by the stronghold in the House, by House leadership, that does not want to move legislation forward. So one of my goals is to join caucuses with colleagues where we talk about how we also have a little bit more transparency and uh, a little bit less of a stronghold in leadership, which I think is, is key to this question. Uh, the next question will come from Stan, and Lindsay will be the first to answer. Uh, the Department of Public Utilities plays a pivotal role in how much and how fast we increase the use of renewable, renewable energy in Massachusetts, as well as the location and construction of additional fossil fuel infrastructure, such as gas pipelines. Mm -hmm. In the past, though, the DPU has limited public participation in their proceedings. How would you, as a legislator, make the DPU more transparent and uh, require them to allow more participation by residents, municipal officials, as well as legislators. Right, so this is something I've heard an awful lot about in this community, frustration with the DPU and, and not being heard, quite honestly, and even just getting meetings with them. Um, it's the Department of Public Utilities. They are for the public, for the people. And you know, we're gonna to need to put every sort of pressure we possibly can to make sure that there are public hearings, that they are listening to what the citizens of Massachusetts, the residents of Massachusetts actually care about. Um, you know, they just approved the first in the nation demand charge for metering. This, this is not Massachusetts leading the way. This is Massachusetts going backwards. So I would absolutely work with colleagues to, to change the situation with the DPU. I, I would agree. I mean, there's not much I would add to that, um, but the pressure does have to come from the legislature, and I would be prepared to do that as well. Next question will be one from the audience that Jean is going to read on their behalf. Would you support legislation that would override local zoning for wind and solar power projects? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, I really believe in, you know, communities should be able to set their own uh, standards for zoning. Uh, I would be very reluctant to override what local communities want um, on those issues or, or other um, zoning issues. Uh, I, I think it's really important that we let communities make those decisions. I agree that this is a tough question because properly sited solar and wind is, it's important. We, we can't be putting solar panels, particularly in this area when I think of the amazing farmland we have, right? We don't want to see solar fields put on that farmland. At the same time, when we have communities who are doing the not in my backyard and they don't want wind turbines, I'm thinking of off the Cape now, that's a more difficult issue. That is actually to the benefit and it's it may not be as pretty, but it's, it's something that we're going to need to move forward. So I don't know if I would bl have a blanket statement to say we need to override all zoning regulations, but I do think we need to be thoughtful about that because there may be instances in which that's necessary. But proper siting is, is key to making solar and wind effective. Thank you. Um, our next question will be asked by Nancy, and Lindsay will have the opportunity to answer it first. Sure. How much fossil fuel infrastructure does Massachusetts need or want? 
Most of our natural gas is fracked and imported from other states. Do you think it is time to stop building more gas pipelines and switch to more renewables? Should electric customers pay a pipeline tax to pay for new gas pipelines? So I have not spoken to all residents of Massachusetts, but I will say those with whom I have spoken do not want new pipelines, do not want to be using fossil fuels, and certainly don't want to be paying taxes for pipelines. And they also don't want to be paying for the gas leaks, because that's, that happens as well. Those costs are passed on to consumers. Um, I don't know. I feel like I should be giving a longer answer to this question, but it felt really easy. Um, no, no new pipelines. No new pipelines, no fracking. Uh, what we need to be doing is, and, and, and no consumer should not be responsible for paying for the repair of those gas leaks or for new pipelines. And, and what we should be doing is instead of heading in the direction of new fossil fuel um, plants, that flies in the face of what we're trying to accomplish here. So no new fossil fuel plants. Everything we should be moving towards renewable energy sources and developing renewable energy sources wind and solar, period. Thank you. All right, our next question goes to Adele. And Diana, you'll answer it first. Yeah, I'd like to turn our attention to climate justice issues. As we've heard, uh, Springfield is, is uh, the number one in asthma. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a terrible distinction to have in our area. What would you do as a legislator to ensure that communities like Springfield, who are most impacted by climate change, will have access to green jobs and other opportunities as soon as they become available, and to give them a voice in the decision making on uh, various policies? Bringing, have, giving them a seat at the table is step one. Um, admitting to ourselves that cities do bear the brunt of pollution, environmental health hazards, oftentimes homes that people are living in are run down, they're leaky, they're drafty. Um, we need to be working on, on changing those things. Um, obviously, bringing everybody to the table, collaborating on this. Um, not citing any new, you know, we're, if we're talking about biomass facilities or something like that in Springfield, we don't need them. We shouldn't be doing them. Those, um, we've, we just talked about that in the last question. Um, so we shouldn't expect people to have to live, work, and play close to so sources of pollution. We need to focus on cleaning that up. That is both, you know, environmental justice is economic justice, is social justice. They all go hand in hand, and we have to focus on all of them at once. And, and there's, there's similar problems in some very rural areas as well. Um, but I think that, you know, obviously they're concentrated mostly in cities, and we need to, we need to take care of that. So I agree with, with almost all of that. I will say, when we're talking about bringing people to the table, though, it's not enough that we just bring local officials in those towns to the tables because we often know that the local officials don't always represent the demographics of a city and the local officials are generally not the ones who are sending their children to a school that is underneath the highway. So when we talk about bringing everyone to the table, that means that the people who are in office need to go into those communities and actually go really into those communities to talk to the people who are directly impacted in real ways because that's truly bringing everyone to the table. Far too often we say we've, we've met with an official, we've met with someone who leads an organization and we're done, we're not done. And that's why we're still seeing these issues, why we're still seeing such economic injustice happening. Next question will be asked by Stan, and then so you get to answer it first. Sure. Buildings are a major source of energy loss. What changes would you support for new construction as well as retrofitting, such as stronger energy efficiency building codes, a uh, requirement for electric vehicle charging uh, stations, and a requirement for rooftop solar? Well, I would love to see all of that happen for new construction, to be sure. It's really important, however, that we're not just building new homes that are high-end homes. We need to make sure that we are 
creating net zero building for affordable housing as well. And there are programs in the state that can help finance that. One of the things I would like to see are green banks. I know that there are local builders who are really been, they've really been focusing on making sure that there is affordable housing. Northampton does have a real lack of affordable housing. In terms of retrofitting, um, there's a great program right now in Northampton, the Button Up Northampton, that's happening where people are actually helping people understand how they can retrofit their homes. Massachusetts has the oldest home stock in the country. So retrofitting is really going to be what we need to focus on. New construction is a little bit easier. I agree. I agree with everything she said. I think that Massachusetts, um, the only thing I would add is that we need to, we need to set the pace and our housing projects that we develop, our public housing, um, affordable housing units, need to set the standard and be net zero. Um, and and we, we, we really need to work on, on getting that as a standard as fast as we can before we expect other people to do the same thing. We have an obligation to do that. Thank you. And Jean's going to read a question from the audience. How can we make the Pioneer Valley a model for low carbon renewable energy resources? Low carbon renewable energy energy resources um, you know I think Is that resource? you know we take some steps here you know we do some we do some what we might consider smaller things I mean we we ban bags you know we've we've had public buildings built with geothermal heat systems and I think that that's really um, a way that we do set the tone and set the pace here you know we can obviously always do more and I think that one of the ways we can do that is we can tap UMass and some of the technologies that they're developing, and we can be the pioneers who use them first. And I think that that's probably the best way we can do it. So I, I do agree with that, although I will say that the entire country of Rwanda managed to ban plastic bags, so I'm not sure how we're leading really there, if, you know, um, one, one municipality. But um, yeah, I, I completely agree about UMass. I would really like to see us develop particularly battery storage for solar. That is the thing where we're lacking, and that's what's um, keeping us from really truly electrifying um, our transportation and our homes and everything else with clean renewable energy. Thank you. Nancy will be asking the next question. Nancy first. Sure. Would you refuse contributions from fossil fuel companies or utilities and their lobbyists? Would you encourage your colleagues to do the same? Absolutely. That's a very easy question. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> this debate is going to end early. No. <laughs> That's what I wanted wow. to hear. <laughs> Some very succinct candidates. It's refreshing. <laughs> um, all right. Adele will be asking the next question. Diana, you'll be answering it first. Massachusetts has the potential to be a global leader in clean energy technology and research. Would you support legislation creating a plan to expand and fund clean energy technology and research? And what specific areas would you prioritize um, that you think need and deserve further research here? Well, we, we've been talking about UMass, and, and the battery storage is probably one of the most exciting things that they're doing over there right now. That's, that is one of the barriers that we face to going to true electric technology, both smaller scale vehicle um, technology and larger scale things like microgrids. Um, and being able to have that, that battery storage for microgrids. Microgrids will allow us to more easily convert to renewable sources of energy, and so that battery storage is critical. So that would be um, definitely something I would support. Uh, you know, UMass, UMass has been a pioneer in wind technology as well. So I think that we need to support them. We need to recognize them both as the leading research institution that they are and as the economic driver that they are here in the Pioneer Valley. 
So I agree with all of that. I will add, I'm particularly interested in, I, in seeing that we have um, the Stockbridge at UMass, and, which is you know training the next generation of farmers. I also think that things like carbon sequestration are really interesting. Different farming techniques that really get the carbon back into the earth, there are so many. Um, that would be really exciting if this area could lead on that, especially if we see that bringing newer people into farming. Dan will be asking the next question, and then you have the opportunity to answer it first. Uh, what actions do you advocate to mitigate climate disruption in Massachusetts, and particularly, how would you help local communities adapt to the threat of more flooding, droughts, and other extreme weather events? So I, it's interesting that you say this because I just mentioned carbon sequestration, and I was actually researching today, because that is what you do when you're preparing for a debate, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, techniques that have been developed in Iceland to um, remove carbon from the water, because I am extremely passionate about our oceans and the acidification and rising sea levels. Um, while they may not directly impact this region, are going to impact our state, because we are going to be paying for the flooding and the rising waters. Um, that if we don't, if we hit two degrees, that means it's gonna be devastating to Massachusetts. So there, there's really amazing technology out there that I would like to see our state invest in as well, where we're removing carbon from the water. Um, you know, I've, I've worked on um, community emergency preparedness plans, and I think that we need to make sure that those, those, the funding of making sure communities are prepared for those things, because we know that we're gonna have um, prolonged precipitation events we're going to have drought, we're gonna have fires. Um, and so making sure that individual communities have individual plans that make sense for them is a great thing. But I also think another part of that is, is trying to switch over to microgrid technology because another thing that I think we're gonna be experiencing for a variety of reasons, weather related events and whatever, are power outages. And microgrids are gonna keep us from having another situation like we had in October of 2011. Um, where the entire area was, was without power for so long. So those would be things I would focus on. All right, um, next question will come from Jean, a question from the audience, and Diana, you'll answer first. Okay, I hope I get this right. It's sometimes difficult to read different handwritings. Um, the, the Department of Public Utilities seems weighted toward the industries. Uh, it's regulating. What would you do to balance input from the informed public and those with expertise in renewables? We need to remember that the utilities, well, first of all, the, the utilities are a monopoly, basically. Um, and, and we really need to turn that around. They need to work for us. We need to have much more input in what's happening there. DPU should be um, an agency that we can rely on to really to really step on them, and, and that's not what's happening. So as we talked about before, I think that the pressure needs to come from the legislature to step on DPU to make sure that, that those goals are accomplished. Um, I agree with that. I would also like to see um, you know, more people coming to the table, the legislature actually bringing the DPU to the table with the public, with, stakeholders, with the environmental experts. Um, I think it's really, you know, interesting how now we have this, Northampton in particular is, is engaging in this new initiative where we are partnering with, I'm gonna make a mistake and say the wrong towns, but I believe it's, it's Pelham and Amherst, and we're deciding as a community what kind of percentages of renewables we're gonna have. If the legislator is not gonna act as quickly as it needs to, I think those initiatives are going to need to be moved forward more quickly. So, um we're running a little ahead of schedule. I'm gonna suggest, um, we, but it looks like we have a number of additional audience questions. So, um, so Jean, if you would like to um, select a few audience questions and perhaps share them with other panelists to take turns asking on behalf of audience members, because I'd like to, um, to hear from the audience as much as possible. Um, and, and then we'll, we can take turns. Okay. Does that sound good? We're ad-libbing a little bit here. <laughs> so, Jean, why don't you ask the first question and then you can pass a couple more down to your colleagues there. 
you agree on almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> thought this was a good one. This is a good one. Is there anything that distinguishes your positions, Ray Climate? What experience do you have arguing your position and changing minds? And who's first? I forgot. Lindsay is first on this one. So I will tell you that I have watched all of these debates, and it seems like that question is asked every time because every candidate seems to get up here and says, says the same thing. So it's not just this debate. It's all of the debates. Um, I don't know if these should even be called debates, quite honestly. Um, but you know, experience changing minds, that comes from wanting to go into your community and have one, having one-on-one -on -one discussions. And that's something that I've been doing for all types of legislation um, my entire life. So it's, you know, it comes from, from within, you know, that desire to convince other people and to, to use the arguments that you know are going to convince that person. I've talked a lot, I think, in my opening remarks about how this is an environmental, climate change is an environmental issue, it's also an economic issue. Sometimes it's saying that. Sometimes reframing the argument is how you convince others. Um, I don't know if there's a point that we really truly disagree on, but, um, so I'm gonna leave that part of the question out, but, you know, in terms of, of getting in there and really, you know, getting down to the nuts and bolts of conversation and finding out why someone holds the belief that they do, and then switching the um, the frame in order to convince them of your point. That's something I like to do. Uh, no, I, I actually I think it's I, I think it's great that we actually agree on most things, and I think we will probably on issues outside of climate. Um, in terms of changing people's minds, um, I you know. I, I've served in elected positions before. That's part of what you have to do. And I think it's important, you know, it's not just important to try to change someone's mind, but to also see things from their perspective. And I think that being able to see um, issues from all sides um, and be willing to collaborate and work together to find a solution that might necessarily not necessarily change anyone's mind, but find that common ground and that middle ground has always been a strength of mine. Um, and so I think that would be, um, that's sort of the approach I take rather than going in and thinking I'm gonna change anybody. But how do we find some common ground here and work together? Nancy, will you be answer, asking the next question for the audience? Okay. So we'll go to Diana first. Currently, the Massachusetts House agenda is tightly controlled by Speaker DeLeo and three other representatives. This has resulted in slowing and stalling progress or critical legislation. Example, RPS, re Renewable Point Source, um, Standards. For renew yes, renew renewable portfolio standards, uh, solar caps, etc. What strategies would you use to break this leadership logjam? Well, I think that uh, you know there are a lot of really useful caucuses um, that exist, and and Lindsay touched on this earlier. That I think it's important to take part in those caucuses as a progressive caucus. Um, Solomon Goldstein Rhodes started a clean energy caucus. That's where you build the strength and the numbers of legislators to try to move these things um, through collaboration. So yes, there is a stronghold in the House. I think we're all aware of that. Um, you know, there are some representatives uh, in the House right now that I really admire because of their ability to um, get along with leadership but also make some change. Um, Representative Decker is one of those. She's, she's really good at working both sides. But there is definitely, uh, what is it, go get along to go along or mentality in the House. And, and even worse, now there's a stronghold in leadership, but there's already sort of a B-bench planned because there are people in the House who feel that 
for some reason you're entitled to to move into leadership after a fashion. So building, joining these caucuses with enough like-minded people who understand that there is no entitlement in public service, that we need to, uh, the next speaker is going to need to be someone who's interested in transparency and really restoring democracy to Massachusetts because when we see so few bills passed in a legislative session, that does not feel like democracy. May I ask one quick related question to that? Real, real fast, or should I wait until the next round? No, go ahead. I recently found out that the House does not routinely record all of its votes, either as a full House vote or committee votes. This is outrageous. They're operating in a black box. What are you going to do about that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, do you want me to go, or who, how do you want us to go? I think you may, it I'm, doesn't matter. I mean, yeah. just a quick uh, reaction. <laughs> I, I mean, obviously, I would do anything that I could to increase transparency in government across the board. Right, I'm, I'm going to like keep add to that and say that it's even worse than that, right? Because we have these hearings and we see the pieces of legislation and we all testify. And then what happens to the bill after is done behind closed doors. A lot is done behind closed doors. But we need someone in office who is going to break through that. There are people in the State House who are willing to work with their constituents and with activists and with their colleagues and say, like, this is not okay. This is what the legislation looks like. This is where it's going. How can we convince enough people now to put pressure on their representatives, on leadership to make these changes? It's When I talk about bottom-up government, that's what we need to move towards. Enough of this top-down thing. It is not serving us. I see that Stan has the next audience question, and this will go to Lindsay first. Okay. Um, the question is, uh, sometimes renewable energy refers to nuclear power. Do you, do you endorse nuclear power or only solar and wind? We, we know you, you endorse solar and wind, so why don't you address any concerns that you might have about nuclear power? So no, I don't endorse nuclear power. Um, I've heard the argument that it can potentially provide clean energy, but I'm sure like all of you, we saw what happened in Japan. The uh, the potential effects of nuclear are just, the risk is just too big. We do not know what to do with nuclear waste. There has never been the technology to support that. It is not something that I would ever want to see us move towards. I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, just stop and think about where in this state would you propose we put that? There's nowhere that is an acceptable place for a nuclear power plant, period. Thank you. So Adele, you can pose the next audience question. Diana, you'll take it first. This question is, what have you done in your personal and political life that is climate and environmentally friendly? and? As a legislator, where would you rank climate in your list of legislative priorities? So climate would definitely be in the top five. Same question. Um, Same question. Uh, there's, 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 we have, we have so many pr priorities that we need to work on: healthcare and and affordable housing and economic development is definitely in the top five. And what have I done personally? Um, I'm sorry. Could you just repeat? personally and professionally. Um, you know, personally, I mean, we all try to, to do our best, right? To love our mother and protect our earth. Um, I hang my clothes out, I don't dry my clothes. Um, but, I, and professionally, I mean, for me, you know, at this point, I've, I've supported Peter's mission um, and the things that Peter did. As a legislative staff person, you, you, you by nature, sort of take a back seat and don't put your own politics first. Um, and so now it's kind of refreshing for me to be able to put my ideas out there and be able to think about things that I would really like to do now, um, you know, to move forward. So I'll admit I just got stuck thinking about what I do personally, so I think I forgot half of the question. Um, so I'm going to start with that. Or do you want to repeat it? Okay, can you repeat the first half? What electricity? Personally and professionally, um, 
in the interest of climate and the environment, and where would climate oh, rank sure. list of legislative priorities? Sure. So I am going to answer the second part first. So. I don't see issues as individual issues. We don't, we don't, um, we aren't successful when we think of issues in silos. We're successful when we realize that they're interconnected. So I, again, have talked about the healthcare situation in Springfield. That's a, that's a healthcare issue. That's an environmental issue. These are all very connected. So I can't say environmental issues are within my top five because they're all, con they're connected. Every single issue, transportation, healthcare, education, it connects to the environment. So I would never neglect to take a holistic approach when dealing with these. Um, Personally, we also don't own a dryer. We don't own small appliances. I drive an electric car. Um, I was raised by a conservationist, that's in my closing remarks, so I don't turn my heat above 60 degrees because that's how I was brought up. We don't waste water, we don't leave on lights. I mean, it's just all these really basic things that I was taught as a child, this is how we protect the earth. So, I have a, a question for Jean. So um, I, I see that we have a number of audience questions, but I don't have a sense of how many of them are on different topics than what we have already covered. Could you give me a recommendation? Do we have a few more that are on different topics that, um, that Here's we can one ask? It's different. Uh, Pardon the delay. <laughs> Yeah, okay, let me yes. ask this one in the meantime. Okay. All right. You both support you both support funding mass transit. How will you get more people in Western Mass to actually use it? Who is it? Lindsay goes to me. Well, so we need to make sure that the routes are actually serving people first and foremost. Um, it's you know, it's wonderful to have mass transit, but if it if those routes are not helpful to get people to work or to school. And, and this is something that happens a lot, right? We Routes are changed and then they're no longer useful and then they're eliminated and then funding is cut because people are no longer taking it. So it turns into a bit of a vicious cycle. Um, we need to make sure that we have people really providing input as to what is, is most useful. I think that when we talk about train, which is also mass transit, I mean, that is something that we're going to need. It opens up so many doors for people to live and to work and to study either here or in other parts of the state. I mean, we need that level of interconnectedness, especially if we want to talk about economic development in Western Massachusetts. So what's left? I think we need to acknowledge that this is really one of the stumbling blocks to, you know, to, to public transportation here, that it's not as much of a way of life here as it is in, in Eastern Mass, right? We're spread out. It's not as convenient. There's not as many routes. Um, you know, People just, it, we just live further apart. Um, but I like to think that between our aging population um, and, and our younger generation that's coming up that I think is, com is much more open to the idea of public transportation, I think that we have an opportunity to offer um, routes and, and um, opportunities for older people to start using public transportation. And, and, and then we, you know, we do have some interest from commuters, right? We see the park and rides are full during the day. Um, I, I think it's a little bit of a challenge to really inspire people out here to use public transportation as much as they do in Eastern Mass, but we need to try. So do we have three more audience questions? And then we'll allow our candidates to make some closing statements and rest their heads a little bit. We've, this has been rigorous, <laughs> so thank you. Well, I, I would like to ask a question. Um, we have heard from numerous representatives that they have very limited access to the speaker, that in fact they're really only, uh, they have to only pick one issue to talk to the speaker about because that's all you get. And so I'm wondering, uh, how would you rank climate as uh, among those issues? If you had only one issue to talk to the speaker about, what would it be? This goes to Diana first. Um, well, you know, I talked in my opening remarks about intersecting priorities. Lindy just referred to it as well. So it does, it, it really becomes a challenge to identify one single um, issue that you'd want to speak to the speaker about. Um, 
you can, I, I would hope that you'd be able to bring an issue up in a way where, that you can talk about clean energy development with the component of jobs, economic development and that sort of thing um, and do your best to sneak some other things in there. I think that's really, that one, one, one topic just wouldn't, just wouldn't be enough. So, so I have, I have two things to say about this. First of all, um, representatives represent their constituents, so it, it really does matter what constituents say and what constituents are pushing for as to what a priority is. I, I know, you know, personally what my priority is, but I'm not elected to represent myself. I'm elected to represent the people of this district. So, so first of all, there's that in, in determining what legislative priorities are. It really, it really matters what the people want. Um, you know. It is true that, you know, we hear this all the time, it is difficult to meet with the speaker and to talk to the speaker, but that's what coalition building is about. So when we're talking about joining caucuses, we're joining caucuses so that while we may only have that one opportunity, other legislators are able to go in and perhaps they have better relationships with the speakers or they've been in office longer and they're able to bring more things to the table. So it is cultivating those relationships. So. You know, whoever is elected is a is a first year representative. That's just the truth. It doesn't matter what all the rest of our experience is. We're going in there on the same footing. So we're going to have to relationship build. And that's just going to be the most important thing to getting anything done. Thank you. We'll be asking the next question from the panel. On behalf of the, do we have another audience yep. question yeah, to I'll relay? <laughs> all right, Stan okay. will be asking and they'll go to you first, Lindsay. Sure. Uh, although we are uh, inland, we are still our stewards of our coastline. What can you do to prevent uh, gas or oil drilling off the uh, Massachusetts coast? Well, thankfully, we have a wonderful attorney general. <laughs> so I will be supporting the attorney general in all of her lawsuits against our federal government should they try to um, push offshore drilling. I am hopeful that our governor will maintain his promises and n not allow such things, but it is much harder um, when we are combating the federal government, but I would always do everything in my power to support those who can prevent this. It would be a disaster. I, I agree wholeheartedly, absolutely no, 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 no. Um, but maybe development of things like Vineyard Wind, which is looking really promising, would, would switch the focus to instead of thinking that offshore drilling is the is the way to go, that offshore wind, make it you know if these if these initial projects can be successful, then I think that's that's going to go a long way to just curbing the appetite for offshore drilling. Okay. We have one more question from the audience. This one is a little specific, but I know it uh, relates to a lot of us. Uh, do you support or oppose the pipeline fix that would allow Columbia Gas to lift its moratorium on new gas hookups? I, I believe um, to lift the cap, the company wants to build additional gas pipelines. Is that correct? Okay, so um, there's a lot of conflict in, in. Well, we're being held hostage um, by the gas companies. They're they're holding that over us as leverage. The truth of the matter is that there's a lot of leaks. I mean, National Grid acknowledges 11,000 leaks in Massachusetts. So it seems to me that repairing the pipeline and not at the ratepayer's expense is the way to go because it's obviously going to increase your capacity if you're not losing any. It does away with the hazard of the leak. Um, uh, so I guess I, I, they need to be held responsible for those leaks and then, and then deal with the, capa the capacity may be dealt with in that way. That's how I feel. Well, as someone who's had leaks in her neighborhood, I absolutely agree that they should be dealing with the leaks. But I don't think we actually have a capacity problem. I think we have uh, we have a 
pipeline problem. We shouldn't be doing anything to build new pipelines. And I, I think that we're going to have to be really proactive on this. And I know I mentioned before there are members of our community who are doing that already. We need to, first of all, be encouraging our community to move towards renewables right now on an individual basis. We need to be making sure that our homes are insulated, that we are um, using as less as little energy as possible um, so that we can really prove that the capacity is not an issue. There is no need for a pipeline. We know that that is just a money-making scheme. Thank you. So the panelists have just answered about 24 questions and very succinctly. Thank you so much. I really appreciate um, all the thought that went into the questions. Um, I, I think we're going to move on to the next to, to our closing statements. So uh, candidates have prepared two-minute closing statements. And um, and then if there, are, if there are audience members who have questions that we did not have time for, I'm sure our candidates will be milling around and you can um, chat with them after. So um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my notes and the closing <laughs> statement. Lindsay's going first. Thank you. <laughs> sure. So I want to close by once again thanking the League of Women Voters and Climate Action Now as well as the audience for their thoughtful questions. This is Northampton, so I knew there would be thoughtful questions, and there is little I like more in life than discussing policy. I also want to thank my daughter who for coming tonight. It is not easy for an 11-year-old to sit through a forum, especially because this topic is deeply felt in our home. I said this before, but I grew up in a family of environmentalists where names like Rachel Carson and John Muir were tossed around a whole lot. And um, conservation is not just something that we preach, but we really practice it. So my daughter is growing up in a world, however, where there's an even greater urgency than when I was a child around climate change. And it will be, for my generation and for hers, the greatest issue that we face. And it's really easy to despair at this task that we have before us. But I am a person who believes in hope and change and who understands that what is hardest to do is also the most necessary and also the most worth doing. I'm excited and energized at the prospect of digging deeper into the work of weaning our economy and our society off their fossil fuel dependency and towards clean energy. I'm ready to build the coalitions needed to make this happen, and I will use my strong connection, connections with our progressive legislators and our passionate activists in this community, so many of whom are here tonight, to strengthen local and statewide coalitions to come up with real solutions and to actually pass them. I will do the hard but important work of building bridges between communities so that no voices are ever left out of the equation. Effective organizing never happens in silos. Effective legislation must take a holistic approach as well. Most importantly, I will never expect people to just come to me to do this work. I will go to them. I am about government with the people. The urgency of this issue demands it. I look forward to talking with all of you more about this. So in closing, I would also like to thank um, the League of Women Voters and Climate Action Now, as well as um, my opponent, Lindsay. This was actually really fun to, um, to have this opportunity to be together and do this today, um, and the audience members as well. Um, I want to say that I'm really proud to be from a district that so highly prioritizes environmental protection. You know, we live here because we value open space, clean air, clean water, forests, wetlands, and beautiful farmland. I've amassed extensive experience that you can rely on on day one. I worked for a municipal attorney where I drafted bylaws, fought big box development, and worked on land protection matters. I was elected to the Hatfield Board of Selectmen and had the opportunity to make bold moves to protect our aquifer, our forest land, and our farmlands. As a private citizen, I'm proud to say that I led the fight to stop the construction of a cell tower that would have been built smack dab in the middle of a residential neighborhood. And I very proudly worked with Representative Cocott, where I learned the intricacies of state government and develop relationships with officials and activists that will be invaluable as I move forward with an agenda of intersecting priorities, including environmental protection, economic development, and social justice. 
For the first time in 16 years, we're being asked to select a new state representative. This comes during an unprecedented time of loss of clout and experience in our area. It's imperative that your next representative has a sound understanding of the issues, as well as an understanding of the way to address them. I ask you to support my candidacy because I have both the progressive heart you expect and the experience that will be required to accomplish our common goals. I would be both proud and grateful to have your vote on September 4th. So that concludes this evening's forum. I would like to thank Climate Action Now, League of Women Voters, NCTV for coming together to make this happen, our panelists, our candidates, and you, the voters, who will be going to the polls shortly. And thank you so much for coming to become more informed this evening. Have a good night. <laughs>